This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Joe Bonney. Here's part two of our discussion with Camilo Mejia. If you haven't heard part one, definitely go back and listen to it. Although it's not needed to understand part two. Enjoy, folks. And, you know, uh, for me, you know, that really captures my, my experience. You know, when I, when I went to Iraq, I was questioning a lot of things, but um, I, I came from a Sandinista background, right? I, my, my parents are both Sandinistas fighting against this dictatorship that you talked about. The Somoza family it was actually more than 40 years. Um, uh, it was most of the time it was the Somozas, you know, but, you know, for a very brief periods of time during more than, than four decades, you know, it was Somoza puppets. And yeah, indeed, they were left behind by by the U.S. You know, when they the U.S. left um, after that occupation that ended with Sandino, uh, when Sandino, the the liberal general, you know, who went rogue, um, refused to to put down his weapons, you know, after a deal that was made, um, brokered by the U.S. between the liberals and the conservatives, and which which is almost to say like you know, like the, the Democrats and the Republicans here, right? Uh, but we could, we could even go back further because U.S. imperialism is Western imperialism, right? So it's, it's like, it's something that continues, you know, from the colony before the U.S., you know, and in, in, in the North, it was, it was the British crown and here was the Spanish crown. We were basically subjects to the Spanish crown, uh, much like people in the U.S., you know, were subjects to the British crown. And what you have is a, a struggle of power that um, on one hand, traditionally, this, is, this has been the conservatives, right? But on one hand represents, you know, that crown power, you know, it represents the extraction of goods and, and, and resources from the land, you know, to be brought into the empire. Um, and in the case of the U.S., that was the British crown. In the case of Latin America, that was the Spanish crown. And with the U.S., U.S. imperialism, once the U.S. kicks off Spain and says, you know, America for, for Americans, it's basically just a change of management, right? But it's basically, it's the same thing, right? It's the same, it's the same stuff that, that, that happened all over the American continent, you know, first with the British and the Spanish and, you know, after that with, with the U.S., but what happened was that we had an oligarchy, which unlike other oligarchies or like the, uh, the concept of oligarchy in a place like, for instance, um, Ukraine where, or Russia, you know, where an oligarch is someone who has X amount of money and access to media resources and things like that. In Nicaragua, these were the people left behind by the crown, the, uh, the landowners, you know, who viewed indigenous and, and poor people as an extension of their right and their land and their power, you know, and, and, and when the Spanish left, they left behind these people, you know, who had all the political power, all the social power, all the economic power, all the land. And, you know, they never really had a vision of progress. You know, they, they inherited that, that uh, feudalist mentality. But alongside that, you had the merchants, you had the people who wanted to get into imports and exports. And they were not landowners, you know, they were, they were into commerce and they wanted to bring people from the rural areas into the metropolis and develop roads and railroads and bridges. And they needed to build schools for the workers, the people who would come from the, the rural areas into the cities. And so they had a bit of a more progressive um, vision of you know what kind of nation they they wanted to have and so we had that in in Nicaragua and we had that all throughout Latin America right you had the oligarchy which is like the all power you know handed over by the the, the Spaniards that left and then you had the new power you know the new money the bourgeoisie and so in Nicaragua that has completely played out you know um you know to the T basically, where you had these two forces that always were fighting. And the U.S. was basically um, the, the role that the U.S. played in Nicaragua historically has been to basically broker the peace between those two factions of political and economic power 
so that whatever government is there basically oversees U.S. interests. And so within that power struggle, you know, we had um, a bourgeois liberal uh, nationalist, which was uh, President Zelaya, who wanted to basically build schools and wanted people to be able to learn to read and write, wanted to build hospitals and, you know, had a lot of progressive ideas, was not a, like a revolutionary like Sandino was because Sandino, um, he was the son of a rich landowner and a servant, a peasant woman, right? So he had a little bit of both, you know, he had a little bit of like this oligarchic mentality. His dad was very progressive and his, his brother ended up fighting with him. But, you know, like half of him was, you know, like this wealthy, he lived in poverty until he was like, I think, 11 years old or something. And that he was a bastard child, of course. But he, he had seen both of those. He had seen that, that extreme poverty and he had seen wealth. And so for him, you know, the, when Sandino comes into the picture, he basically disrupts that balance, you know, between liberals and conservatives, you know, between old money and new money that at the end of the day did whatever the U.S. told them to do. So Sandino brings in another a, a very different kind of nationalism into the picture because it's a popular nationalism. And so the revolution that we have with Sandino is not a bourgeois revolution, like the revolutions that we had in the past, which were revolutions in which conservatives and liberals were fighting for power and the U.S. would come in and basically mediate a peace between them so that they could continue extracting the wealth. When Sandino comes into the picture, he comes in with ideas from the Mexican Revolution and communism and other things like that. And he, or, he or obviously he comes from like this extremely poor background, you know, where his mother was this peasant woman who had been highly exploited and kicked to the side. And his dad was this wealthy landowner. And so he, can, he comes in with a sort of like class analysis into the picture. And from that moment on, and we're talking about now 1927, when Sandino basically rejects this balance between liberals and conservatives. Uh, but from that moment on, you know, the, uh, the nationalist struggle of Sandinismo, and that's, what, that's his birth, um, the people, you know, the peasants, the uh, indigenous people, people without shoes, people without education, people who are illiterate, become actors of change in Nicaragua. You know, they become actors of revolution in Nicaragua. And so, we have a dark period, you know, which is when Sandino rebels against this pact, you know, between liberals and conservatives, and he takes up arms against the U.S. and beats the U.S. And this is one of the very few military defeats of the United States, you know, back in the, uh, the, the 20th century. Um, and Marines actually learned guerrilla tactics from pursuing um, Sandino through the mountains of, you know, northern Nicaragua. We were actually the first site of aerial bombardment, um, which is basically when the U.S. was going after Sandino, you know, they had planes, they had, you know, warships, they had artillery, they had entire marine units go after Sandino, and they could never catch him because the people that followed him were peasants, you know, there were people from the mountains, there were people who knew the area well. In fact, you know, they were people who were, who worked at mines, you know, they were miners. And so they would use dynamite and they knew how to use dynamite, you know, to work with, you know, the, uh, the natural environment. And they were able to evade capture and to score a lot of big wins to the, to the point that the Marines left Nicaragua. And it was only through treason that they were able to get Sandino. You know, they leave, they leave behind uh, a contingency of U.S. trained um, National Guardsmen. And they put this man in charge. His name is General Somoza. And Somoza signs a peace deal with Sandino and then he assassinates him. And when he assassinates Sandino, that's basically the end of that movement, you know, for between, I wanna say 1934, I wanna say for maybe 22 years, 23 years, something like that, when uh, the, 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 the Somoza patriarch gets, gets basically uh, assassinated by this patriot uh, known as Rigoberto Lopez Perez. And then Rigoberto Lopez Perez basically inspires the Sandinista movement. A few years later, in 1961, the Sandinista Front of National Liberation is founded. 
And it's basically very much defined as a, revol as a popular revolutionary movement, nationalist against US imperialism, proxy US imperialism, because of course we had this family that was a Nicaraguan family, a military dynasty in the Somosas that were there basically, you know, safeguarding US interests. And this Somoza family, uh, that was a military family, their, their roots are in the liberal movement, but they were dictators and, you know, they didn't really care much for this balance between liberals and conservatives. So that means that the bourgeoisie and the oligarchy in Nicaragua did not like Somoza either, you know, because he only represented U.S. interests in Nicaragua. And so that's that's one thing that worked against him was that, you know, the, the, the Sandinistas were able to tap into that resentment, you know, in all sectors of Nicaraguan society to lead a, a popular revolutionary movement to overthrow the U.S. proxy dictator, which was this family the Somoza family that had basically three presidents, you know, the, the father and then two, two of his kids. And then in 1979, you know, we win, we overthrow the, the dictatorship. And, you know, pretty soon we have elections, we win overwhelmingly. And for the next 10 years, you know, the revolution is basically besieged by a number of tactics, you know, uh, employed by the US. You know, you guys probably know about the Iran Contra affair. Um, and other schemes, you know, that the, the U.S. Uh, cooked up to uh, to sustain the contrast, you know, that were sabotaging and terrorizing the population. There was an embargo. There were terrorist acts that led to um, a trial at The Hague, you know, that uh, Nicaragua won again, you know, and, and uh, the U.S. was fined, I, I believe, $17 billion in damages for... Um, acts of terrorism against the Nicaraguan government and people. Um, but it was really difficult to keep the, um, the people um, aligned with, with the revolution, even though like, I, I want to believe in, and I think that there's a lot of evidence to the fact that uh, the people were with the Sandinista movement, with the Sandinista government, but they, we had lost in total more than 50,000 people to the war. Uh, we were in really bad shape. Our infrastructure was crumbling. Um, you know, we were embargoed. So our economy was was in, in really bad shape and people didn't want their, their sons and daughters to, to get killed anymore. They didn't want any more people to, to suffer from the war. And so we lost the elections in 1990. And from 1990 until 2006, we had a succession of governments back to the old dynamic of liberal versus conservative. And, you know, we had governments that were, you know, a little bit of both, you know, they had maybe a liberal president, you know, with like conservative ministers. And to them, it was always a power, a power dynamic, you know, like if they can keep the, the power balance, you know, they're okay. Uh, but eventually, you know, they always go back to fighting and, you know, they, they were fighting amongst them. And the Sandinista uh, movement was able to take advantage of that, and 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 uh, because of their their um, the fracture within the oligarchy and the, the 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 liberals and the conservatives, we were able to uh, to win back power with uh, a majority of the vote that was bigger than the majority that they had together. So I believe we won we won the election with thirty five percent. They had more than thirty five percent together, but because of the fracture we were able to, to win back the presidency. And we started implementing a lot of changes that we had already implemented from the beginning, you know, with the help of President Chavez at the time. Uh, President Chavez uh, came to Nicaragua to offer ALBA funds to the um, conservative president. The conservative president had, I believe, already signed CAFTA-DR, which is the uh, neoliberal treaty uh, in Central America and the Dominican Republic. And so the president said no to Chavez, you know, like we're, we're, we've been neoliberalized and we don't want anything to do with you or your petroleum money or anything like that. So Chavez turned to the Sandinista movement and the Sandinista said, and, and just to point out Chavez, you're talking about Hugo Chavez from Venezuela. President Hugo Chavez, yeah. And so the Sandinistas took the funds, you know, from the Venezuelan government and started to implement anti-poverty measures, even not being in the presidency. And so what you start to see is you start to see an anti-poverty movement 
that's focusing on hunger and malnutrition and uh, housing and things like that, that of course, under a new liberal government, you know, both uh, liberal and conservative, um, you know, we had mortality rates that were through the roof. We had uh, crumbling infrastructure. We had no access to healthcare, no access to education. You know, the country was in really, really bad shape. So this injection of funds into the Sandinista front allows the Sandinista movement to start implementing a lot of these programs. And so by the time we, we win the presidency, we already have a lot of support, you know, popular support, because we were meeting a lot of the basic needs that have been neglected by the neoliberal governments. And since 2007, until now, I do believe you have some figures, but we have been able to reduce dramatically um, infant mortality, uh, maternal mortality. We've, we're up to, I believe, 100% in, um, electric coverage you know, in, in the entire country. I, I believe about 65% is renewable, clean energy. I believe about 35% of the land is in the hands of original peoples. Um, we are like the fifth country in terms of gender equality uh, because of the representation of women in different sectors of the economy and the government. Um, I mean, I could keep going, but the, uh, the, the changes that have been affected, you know, which are a continuation of the first period, are transcendental. You know, the, uh, the power, institutional power, beginning with the, the security apparatus is in, is in the hands of the people. And that's one thing that sets apart Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela from other, you know, progressive or pseudo-progressive governments in Latin America is that we were able to overthrow a U.S.-supported dictatorship, you know, via um, an armed revolution. And that gave us the ability to build the society from the ground up. Uh, along with all its, institu its institutions. So we have a popular police, we have a popular military, we have, you know, we have a ministry of women, you know, that uh, helps um, women and families. We have anti-poverty measures, uh, you know, uh, education. We have universal health care. We're the second poorest nation in the hemisphere and we have universal health care. Uh, so it's like we represent an existential threat to U.S. Uh, power. Because if you are just a little bit richer than Nicaragua, which is 98% of the hemisphere, and you see that this poor nation is able to educate all its citizens, to eradicate um, illiteracy, to provide 100% electricity to all its citizens, to build new hospitals, to rebuild infrastructure, to have amazing roads and all these things, if you invest in people, if you invest in the public sector and you reject neoliberal policies that basically extract your wealth, you know, to sell you back products, you know, after they've been manufactured in the, you know, industrialized, industrialized North, that there's a lot that you can accomplish, right? And so simply by being sovereign and, 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 and looking after the interests of your people, you are able to accomplish so much. So because of that, I think that we remain in the in the sides of the U.S. But also, one thing that I didn't mention and and that that um, that adds to your analysis of the, the the United Fruit Company and and U.S. corporate interests along this whole you know banana republic uh, period is that Nicaragua has a river that connects to a great lake, and it's basically a naturally made canal between the the Caribbean and the Pacific. And the U.S. has always viewed Nicaragua as, as a strategic point. At first, you know, to build a canal, and then once they build the canal in Panama, to prevent from other powers to come into Nicaragua and build a canal that would rival the Panama Canal. And right now we have China basically wanting to build a canal um, in Nicaragua. And, and of course, you know, that's a, a major uh, geostrategic interest that, you know, historic geostrategic interest that the U.S. has had in Nicaragua and, and why they have been so harsh with um, what happens in Nicaragua, you know, is that, you know, we have this not, not naturally made uh, resource that, um, that creates a lot of interest in, in our geography. Um, but yeah, so, that, you know, with all that said, I think that the, the good example that Nicaragua provided 
you know, became something that the U.S. no longer could tolerate. And so in 2018, we were basically targeted by this hybrid war uh, that you and I have been studying a great deal. Uh, let me let me interject real quick here. Hybrid, right. hybrid war, just just so people know what that means. Uh, hybrid war is not not just war with bombs and bullets, right? So here's, I'm going to read a... Uh, the definition from Wikipedia, right? Hybrid warfare is a theory of military strategy first proposed by Frank Hoffman, which employs political warfare and blends conventional warfare, irregular warfare, and cyber warfare with other influencing methods such as fake news, diplomacy, lawfare, foreign ele electoral intervention. By combining kinetic operations with subversive efforts, the aggressor intends to avoid attribution and or retribution. The concept of global war of hybrid warfare has been characterized by a number of academics and practitioners due to its alleged vagueness, its disputed consecutive elements, and its alleged historical distortions. So it's a, it's a type of warfare that combines different types of methods, uh, just like the Wikipedia uh, definition gives it right. It combines you know irregular forces you know by way of you know um, like. Nicaragua suffered in the 80s with the Contras, which was an overt uh, military insurgency, actually, you know, operating from the countryside, you know, and they were being assisted by neighboring countries like, like uh, Costa Rica and Honduras, Panama. Uh, and it also involves, you know, uh, uh, just chaos in the streets, just, just, just you know, so quote unquote spontaneous uprisings and whatnot, just like, uh, just like uh, an experience in 2018 when you have actually uh, late the condition, you have paid agitators, paid instigators in the streets and, you know, try to bring chaos in the streets. Uh, you have, you know, so, you know, you support local unrest, you know, information warfare, propaganda, diplomacy, something, something about lawfare, uh, hyper war lawfare, hy I would call it a lawfare, which is uh, the use of, you know, legal instruments, you know, when you're targeting a particular and in uh, individual, you, you lose, use those different legal instruments pretty much to, to give it the approval of legitimacy, uh, when in fact is, you know, you manipulate, you're, you're weaponizing the legal system. That's pretty much what it is. And you have economic warfare, which, uh, which, uh, before 2018, Nicaragua was under sanctions. Uh, they were under extreme sanctions during the, uh, during the eighties. Uh, they were under sanctions again when. When the, uh, when Daniel Ortega came, uh, where was elected in 27, 20, uh, 2007, yeah, 27. And then there were the sanctions were increased after the 2018 period, uh, you know, uh, the street, um, protest that, uh, that, uh, Camilo is going to go into right now. Was that accurate with that Camilo? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say, but yeah, you captured it. And uh, and I think that uh, going back to what I was saying about getting to power through an armed revolution, you know, makes a huge difference between because it's lawfare. Imagine if for some reason, you know, like a populist in the U.S. is able to win the election, which is like something, in, in my opinion, it's like anything that's outside of the uh, Republican and the Democratic Party right now, it would be pretty much impossible because of all the laws that they have in place. But imagine if somebody wins the election in the US, you know, what the hell are they going to be able to do? Absolutely nothing because the institutional power is in the hands of the two parties, right? And the media is in the hands of the two parties, particularly the Democrats. The courts are in the hands of the two parties. The judicial, the legislative, uh, the media, uh, all the industries that pull the strings, you know, military industrial complex, the entire nonprofit industry, Hollywood, everything, right? And so lawfare basically speaks to that, that you get a populist, you know, that wants to implement laws that are, that are for the benefit of the people, you know, you cook up some uh, corruption charges and you'll get rid of them, you know, like they did to Dilma in Brazil or, you know, um, I, I think that with Zelaya, it was a little bit different because they criticized some of, some of these uh, political uh, reforms that he intended to do, but in the end, it ended up being a, a, a military coup because, you know, they used the military to get him out. But uh, by and large, you know, this lawfare refers to the fact that this old guard, you know, whether it's the bourgeoisie or the oligarchs, you know, they are in, in, the, in power institutionally, 
militarily, economically. In Nicaragua, that's not the case. In Nicaragua, we have popular-led uh, institutions, you know, police, military, judicial, ele electoral um, council. Uh, so, yeah, indeed. Uh, so in 2018, basically, one, one thing me, that... I'm sorry, let me add up that law fair also with this happened here as well in the United States. I can think about uh, FDR. FDR was uh, considered a popular president. He was popular across the street, you know, you know across the working class Americans. And because he was popular, uh, there were conspiracies against him by the, by the, the, the mechanisms that you talked about. Uh, most Americans don't know, or most Americans might not know that, that this, this constraint of two consecutive of, of term limits on a president's right didn't exist prior to, to FDR. Uh, it was put in, it was put in place because of FDR. It was FDR won four consecutive, uh, uh elections because he was so popular. Uh, amongst amongst the average Americans, right? But because he was popular amongst all oh, oh, um, average Americans, once he he passed, right? They they created this mechanism of two terms because they they're trying to because this this mechanism people the people who pull the strings are trying to avoid another FDR to come to power in the United States. Like yeah, it's exactly yeah, and it has to do with the fact that uh, you can't dismantle status quo in one or two terms, it requires more than you have a long-term vision that you need to rehold the entire system, you know, economic, political, social, financial, there's no way you can do it in two terms. So even if a, if a president is incredibly popular and has a lot of people support, um, for any president to be able to dismantle the system, it would take a lot more than two terms. And so I, I think that that's one of the reasons why uh, people like Putin, you know, is still in power, you know, or like people like Merkel, you know, nobody talks about Merkel being in power since the year 2000 until, you know, just a few weeks ago. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, so in 2018, one of, one of the dead giveaways also is that usually the IMF is in the background, right? There's usually some kind of deal or some kind of reform, you know, that has to do with, you know, liberalizing the economy or, you know, signing some kind of deal or some kind of bailout. Um, in, um, I think, uh, in, in, in the Ukraine, there was the association deal with, uh, with the European union that would impose a lot of austerity measures, you know, but of course, Ukrainians would get travel through the European union without any restrictions and be able to work and whatnot. And so they turned it into this like West versus East, you know, struggle, but behind it was a deal, you know, with the IMF. And uh, if you look at a lot of the stuff that's happening right now, where there are a lot of uh, uprisings, you know, in uh, response to neoliberal policies, usually you'll see the IMF or the World Bank or some kind of European Union financial institution behind, you know, trying to implement uh, changes, you know, um, that affect working and middle class people by and large. And NGOs, don't forget about NGOs, like, uh, you know, NGOs that you will think um, that they're, you know, uh, like the National Endowment for Democracy and the uh, USAID, uh, um, uh, you know, different organizations, the, uh, what do you call the other one? The, uh, um, the International Republican Institute, Voice of America, National Democratic Institute. I mean, open Society, Open Society, society. is another one. So these NGOs as well, they, they, they interject because they don't, because they're not connected to the state per se. You know, they come in as, as a uh, people to people type of initiative and they come in into your country and they do this type of, I would call uh, democracy promotion, uh, et cetera. You know, they do, they might come in and do some type of uh, work. Um, in your country, you know, establish, you know, some type of infrastructure media, but at the end of the day, a lot of time, what they are, they're an extension to the, to the actual, to the, to the state where they come from, you know, particularly the Western states. And, and, and one of the things that, that, that was happening in, in Nicaragua, for example, when they were, uh, they target the youth a lot, a lot of the youth, then they do these, um, the, these workshops, you know, it's media workshops and then through these, uh, 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 you know, uh, workshops in, you know, what they call democracy, a lot, a lot of these democracy promotion workshops that has to do with, uh, with teaching people, particularly young people, uh, how to, you know, uh, uh, to protest, you know, how to, uh, you know, and, 
how to do these different type of, you know, what are called uh, nonviolent actions, you know, where, but where they actually use these, uh, um, uh, this action where they do invite us to buy and so on. Uh, um, you saw that in different different countries. You saw that in, in Maidan. You saw that in, in, in Caracas. You see that in Brazilian July 11th in Cuba. What they do is, right, uh, it's called a, a, a marginal violence, you know, marginal uh, something of violence. And it was created. And what it is is put so much stress into to the security forces where they actually, they, they respond. And once they respond, once they respond, then you catch the camera, then you proliferate all the images and stuff like that. And, and, and you create this state of, of, of anxiety and panic and warfare in a country, right? Where you're actually promoting, uh, instead of the, what they call quote unquote democracy, when you actually promoted the overthrow of the, of the current government and to, you know, to conform to whatever agenda you bring into, uh, into you, and, you know, it, 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 the, the intentions, the intentions that you have. Yeah, it's very insidious and it's very uh, it's 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 very deceitful. Uh, a lot of it you can read on Gene Sharp's manual uh, from dictatorship to democracy. I think that he uh, describes about 198 tactics, you know, uh, nonviolent tactics that um, are basically used um, alongside selective use of violence and an entire uh, apparatus of propaganda that is made up not only by of um, social media, but also, um, you know, traditional media, global reach media, and, you know, um, global reach human rights organizations, you know, like the UN, the OAS, uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, and whatnot. And so, the, what what happened in Nicaragua was that they were going after uh, retirement laws, and you know they they the the IMF was basically telling the government that you know you need to increase the amount of years that people have to pay into the system to be able to qualify for retirement, and you know you need to uh, kick out all these people you know who didn't pay enough and that you gave a you know like an emergency retirement because they were older and they never partook in the uh, traditional economy. And so they were older and very poor and they didn't have any retirement. So the government gave them a limited retirement and the IMF said, you need to do away with all that stuff. You know, can't give away anything. You know, people have to pay double the amount of time and you can give that much healthcare as well. And so they, they try to implement a lot of measures, you know, that would really hurt people, especially really, really poor people. And the government said, no, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to increase a little bit the amount of money that, um, you know, working people are going to pay into the system so that we can close the gap, the deficit. And we're going to, um, we're going to take 5% from the cash benefit from retirees, and we're going to put that into the healthcare benefit. Uh, so it was a transfer of 5% and an, and an increment of like maybe 1.25%. And um, the way that they framed it was that the government was cutting um, retirement, uh, that they were basically targeting old people, old poor people. Um, they didn't, of course, they didn't talk about the other part of the deal, which was, you know, kick all these people out and like increase the amount of payments that people have to make. And, you know, they just basically selectively took one part of it and then turned it into uh, this horrible news that the government was, you know, uh, in an effort to uh, to make up for its corruption, was basically targeting poor old people. And so there were um, rallies, you know, against the government. And what happens oftentimes with these color revolutions is that there's some kind of legitimacy to it, right? Like there's some kind of issue going on that they use uh, in order to get people to come out. And then once people come out, there's violence and there's a lot of confusion, right? There's snipers, there's beatings, you know, and there is always a lot of out of context capture of specific moments, you know, uh, footage or pictures, you know, where you have basically for, you know, for instance, you know, you may have snipers shooting at cops, and then when cops realize that they're being shot at with real bullets, they shoot back. And so you already have people there on the scene ready to capture that and say, look, they're using deadly fire. 
against people. And then before you know it, they already have like thousands of bots ready to like bombard people with messages and images and memes and things like that. And then before you know it, the entire machinery of U.S. finance and trained nonprofits and, you know, human rights groups and media, traditional media and social media groups, there's like this coordinated, highly coordinated explosion of news basically portraying the government as criminal, you know, like they're going out there, they're killing innocent civilians, they're killing students and whatnot. And then before you know it, you know, Amnesty is involved, the UN is involved, you know, the entire, you know, global machine of regime change is involved. And it, it's actually in order for them to do that, because this is also the, this is usually done in a place where the government that's in, that's in power has implemented measures that are contrary to the IMF reforms, World Bank, neoliberal deals and things like that, right? And so there isn't really a whole lot of opposition, like popular opposition to the government. The opposition is basically, it, it sprouts out of the manipulation of the news and like the rallies and like the selective use of violence. But by and large, when you look at what's been going on in the country long term, you know, you don't really see a history of oppression. You don't see a history of violence. And what you see is universal health care. What you see is housing programs. You see lowering mortality rates. You know, whether you're talking about Cuba or you're talking about Venezuela or you're talking about Nicaragua or Bolivia, you know, all these dict horrible dictatorships all offer universal health care. They all offer housing and all these things. We get asked often what people can do to help support the podcast. One really powerful way to help us grow and reach more people is to leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, which is the best place to leave a review. iTunes does reach the most people these days. The next best place is Facebook. Go to our Fortress on a Hill Facebook page and look for the reviews tab. Money is tight these days, for everyone, especially in the lingering shadow of COVID. Penny-pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that, and for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer like these fine folks, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, James Higgins, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Rick Coffey, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so very much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. And now, let's get back to the podcast. You know, the, the most wealthiest country in the hemisphere, if not the, the world, uh, which uh, with a bigger population, you know, that doesn't really make sense. And also, I'm looking at the uh, the expenditure of Nicaragua, being a country considered the poorest country in the world, country that's been uh, in war, you know, since, since the '80s. Actually, I mean, they really they haven't really recovered from from the '80s. Uh, you know, however, they're able to to spend uh, 8.4 percent of their uh, uh, of their budget on medical uh, expenditure, right? And compare that to Dominican Republic, for example, which one kind of like I said, one of my, my countries of origin, which with a population of 10 million people uh, and a much wealthier country than, than Nicaragua, right? Their expenditure is 5.9% of, of the population. Now, the Dominican Republic is considered a, it's a close island to the United States, it's considered a, a slave rent democracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Nicaragua is this horrible dictatorship. However, right, they spend more money on healthcare than 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 it's uh, 
the Democratic counterpart of the Negro Republic. I'm looking at the other one, El Salvador spends about 7% of the budget on healthcare, Honduras, 7% of the budget on healthcare. Guatemala has a population of 17 million people. It only spends 6% of the budget uh, on healthcare, whereas Nicaragua, uh, a poor country, uh, spends 8.4% of their, uh, of their healthcare, of their budget on healthcare. Uh, I just want to throw in some numbers there uh, for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. And so it's, you can imagine how difficult it would be to turn the population against a government like that. And so what the U.S. has to do is they have to resort to real, real nasty elements within the society. And this is also something that you see in other applications of uh, regime change, you know, whether you call it, call it revolution or soft coup or whatever. But in Nicaragua, they used um, uh, gang members and, you know, uh, petty criminals, um, drug addicts, and they even imported some of the Maras, you know, which were like this U.S. deported uh, gang members, you know, young gangsters, you know, that were from mostly from L.A., I want to say, uh, from California that ended up in, in uh, El Salvador and Honduras and, you know, to a lesser degree in Guatemala. And so they brought a lot of those people to Nicaragua to basically run uh, these, th these things called tranques, which were basically barricades. And it's how they hope to, uh, to stop the economy in order to put pressure on the people. And they were incredibly violent. And, you know, they would kill people, uh, kidnap people. They would set people on fire. All that stuff is recorded. Of course, the media won't pick it up, right? Like the CNN won't pick it up. Amnesty International won't pick it up. Human Rights Watch won't pick it up. But it's basically what the people of, of Nicaragua were going through. If you look at the Ukraine, what they use there is neo-Nazis, right? Because by and large, even the people who were pissed with Yanukovych because of all the corruption and all of that, like I said, you know, there's usually some, some degree of truth in all of this uh, color revolutions. And so there was some degree of you know, uh, truth in people going out there because it was this reform and they were cutting the benefits of retirees and whatnot. Uh, but by and large, the people did not want to overthrow the government. Um, and so they had to use these nasty elements of society and even import some, some, uh, some help from the outside to overthrow the government or to try to, to, to try to overthrow the government. It's the same thing that they did in Ukraine with neo-Nazis. In Venezuela, they use guarimberos, you know, very highly violent, you know, gang members and, you know, organized crime. Um, in, uh, in, in, in Syria, they use ISIS, you know, and, you know, all these moderate rebels that they call, they're not moderate at all. You know, they're nasty, nasty people. Uh, in Libya, Libya had the highest standard of any African country. Uh, they use people from the awakening councils in Iraq. You know, a lot of the people that were paid to stop fighting the U.S., you know, ended up in this awakening councils. They were the origin of uh, ISIS and, and ISIL and all these groups. They ended up fighting against Gaddafi in, in Libya. Uh, and so, like, every time that you have a popular government, you know, that's both populist and popular because of all these laws and these transformative changes that they have undergone, um, you need to bring in these nasty elements, either, you know, fringe elements within the society, that don't really have a whole lot of power politically or economically or, you know, militarily, and then they get, you know, financed and trained by the U.S. Um, and so in Nicaragua, it was this, this, you know, people from the Maras, you know, in El Salvador and Honduras, and some people, you know, um, very, very poor people, drug addicts and gang members that were basically uh, running this, this um, highly... Um, you know, horrific, you know, scare campaign to basically turn the people against the government. They were not able to do it. You know, the Sandinista militancy came out and was able to dismantle. A lot of people saw what was really going on. You know, people who uh, fell prey to a lot of the, the media um, um, efforts, you know, to portray the, the, the government as criminal. Um, and so we were able to beat it. And of course, you know, after that, you know, the U.S. has continued um, with the sanctions and, and whatnot. But one one quick word on the sanctions is that the larger the larger analysis here, the larger context is the end of U.S. hegemony. 
right? And this is something that we see in many ways, you know, like politically, di diplomatic influence, the financial system is, you know, coming under question uh, because of all the sanctions, you know, that have been applied unilaterally. Uh, so there's all these things happening that are basically pointing to U.S. hegemony and Western hegemony really being in decline in the face of emerging powers, you know, from outside of the West, like China, Russia, Brazil, you know, India, the BRICS countries. Um, and so what we're seeing basically is that the U.S. is doing whatever it can to hold on to this hegemony, to hold on to this to this influence and it's, it's just not working. In the case of Nicaragua, Nicaragua has a, a commerce, a trade surplus with the US because we have been subject to sanctions for such a long time that we've had to rely on our own peasantry, our own people from the rural areas to continue uh, production and to continue growing food. We're 97% uh, food sovereign in Nicaragua. If you look at the basic uh, the basic staples, you know we could be a hundred percent food food sovereign. So sanctions hurt us, but they won't bring us to our knees. We won't starve because we have been able to develop our our agriculture and many other sectors independently from U.S. investment and U.S. capital, industry, technology, and whatnot. And so and that's one of the differences between Nicaragua and Venezuela, for example. Uh, Venezuela, Venezuela before. Uh, before the uh, you know the Bolivarian Revolution, for example, uh, there were the Venezuelan economy was so linked, so interlinked with the with the United States, which you know they uh, imported about what, I think uh, over eighty percent of all their consumer goods were all imported from the United States from abroad. So when sanctions started hitting them, uh, it was really it was it was really hard for them because they had they didn't they didn't cushion they weren't able to cushion themselves. Uh, they had time to push themselves right to um, to those sanctions, right? Whereas Nicaragua, for example, Nicaragua has been under sanctions since you know since, since the late seventies. Uh, and once once the uh, the Sandinista defeated the, the contrast, for example, the sanctions went even harder on uh, Nicaragua, etc. Right? The sanction wasn't wasn't lifted until the neoliberal governments came in ninety in ninety one ninety two. But once Ortega came back to power, once the Sandinista came back to power, the sanctions started creeping up again, you know, so you guys, like saying, you guys have been cushioned, you guys have been used to uh, living on the sanctions, and you guys were able to create an economy within uh, to to resist that sanction, whereas Venezuela didn't, didn't have that 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 opportunity. So when sanctions hit them really hard uh, after 2014, then increasingly on the Trump in 2018, you know, that's where you saw all those images that you saw here. How terrible Maduro is and how how evil uh, the Bolivarians and Chavis are and everything that, but they they're not taken into context as a sanction. But uh, you know, same with Cuba example. Cuba's also uh, suffered sanctions. You know, since the nineteen sixties, since actually the revolution, uh, they had a they had a string. You know, they they had a they were embedded within the rest of the socialist blocs as during the Cold War. But after the Cold War ended in the nineties, right, that's when they entered a special period because they were pretty much left alone, just like North Korea and so you know, they were left outside of the, the global economy and there were sanctions were increasing on them as well. But they also learned how to how to live with it. They also learned how to go around it. They also learned how to, you know, survive on sanctions. Um, you know, just like you're describing with the with Nicaragua. And alongside that, um, going back to this declining hegemony. The bind that the U.S. is in right now is that what happens if the U.S. goes after these economies, you know, that are highly productive and that are very independent, you know, like in Nicaragua, there's a lot of people driven programs, you know, that on tourism, for instance, or trade, local, regional, international, uh, you know, high levels of production, even during the pandemic, you know, because we were able to use other tools to keep people safe. We did not stop production. So we sort of became the breadbasket, you know, of the region. And so the bind that the U.S. is in is that with declining hegemony and in the face of these emerging powers is that where the U.S. withdraws, another power comes in and fills the void, right? So if we stop doing trade with the U.S. because the U.S. says, you know, this horrible dictatorship, you know, does not, it's not deserving of doing trade with the U.S., then China comes in and China says, well, well I'll buy it from you. You know, you have... You have meat, you have beans, you have cheese, you know, whatever you have, we'll buy it from you. 
right? And so, and this is something that's not just true of Nicaragua, but pretty much anywhere. You know, the U.S. is in a really difficult situation because of Chinese influence and because there are all these other nations that, you know, like if, if you look at the uh, the production and wealth being produced by, by the BRICS nations and you look at the European Union, BRICS are more powerful. You know, India is a superpower in terms of technology, military superpower, China in technology, in, in, in finance, you know, along with Russia, you know, Russian weapons are like years ahead of, you know, uh, Western technologies in many cases, not all cases, obviously. But so what happens? So the situation that the U.S. is in is that if they go really harsh against a particular economy, it's almost like an invitation for the Chinese to, to step in and say, okay, well, we'll buy it from you. And the U.S. does not want any more Chinese influence in the, in the continent. So we have been subject to, to, uh, to sanctions, but a lot of those sanctions have been limited in scope. You know, many of them have been targeted at individuals. They've hurt us, but, you know, they, they're not going to bring us to our knees. And, you know, they have not gone completely... Um, out of their their way to 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 completely close off trade with Nicaragua because again like I said you know that would invite other powers to to step in and the U.S. does not want that anymore. Um, so I mean I don't know I think I've I've gone uh, a lot into it I don't know if you guys have any questions or if you want to maybe shift gears and talk about something else but uh, more or less as a gist of the um, the attempted coup. Um. I have a, a, a few questions about the about the Ortega government, Ortega administration as it exists today. Um, in in researching for this, you know that there's there's you find so many different divisions on where people sit about um, what's happening. You know that the 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 revolution, the state of it, the um, that. Um, I'll just name off some of the things that I, I noticed and I, I, I'm not, I don't expect you to, to answer, answer to each of them or anything, but just kind of in creating the general idea that um, the recent anti-terrorism law that uh, outlaws any dissent towards Ortega, um, his wife becoming vice president, um, you know, the, the removal of term limits and um, public services, um, being restricted to only his supporters, and so my 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 real question for you, you know, I I, I like I said, I, I don't I don't want you to uh, to have to defend any of those points, but I do wonder about you know the the recent or it's not recent but but recent the last decade the the Sandinista split, you know that the um, the different things that have come out of you know like the open letter from Noam Chomsky and and Daniel Ellsberg and again I don't I don't um, I don't necessarily agree with everything they said but I, I I do notice that there's there's a lot of people saying what what's really happening here are we still is is what we understand about Nicaragua and about the Sandinista movement um, the same as it was you know and and. Um, lastly, just, and I'll let you, you know, uh, talk about it, that you're, you know, your old man, your own dad, um, someone who stood with the movement for a very long time and, and, and risked his life, um, you know, has had, had a change of heart. And, um, I'm curious for you, you know, is that the, the, if, you know, what, what would be the criticisms that you would make of the Ortega government? Again, not that, you know, every government does, does things that we don't agree with, you know, and I, and so I, but I, I, I think that there's some real questions here about is the movement still um, wedded to the same ideas that it began with? Yeah, definitely. Those are very, uh, say, um, very valid questions. And so let me start with the uh, law dissent, um, outlawing uh, dissent, right? So that was <clears throat> a law very much modeled after U.S. law. Um, the first ones, the first iteration of that law was actually uh, passed by a uh, new liberal oligarchic government, the government of Violeta Barrios Chamorro. Mm. Um, and that was the beginning of that, you know, to basically outlaw dissent. It's not really outlawing uh, dissent as much as it is um, basically banning anything that is 
coming from a foreign power to destabilize the country, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'll give you an example of that. Picture, um, picture Ron Paul. Picture Ron Paul um, expressing that he wants to be the president of the U.S. and then traveling to China and giving an open um, interview, a press conference, you know, basically saying that, you know, that we've had it with the Biden dictatorship, you know, we need sanctions on the U.S. Um, I don't think anything should be off the table. I think that we should even look into a Chinese invasion of the U.S. And, um, you know, we, you know, we really need to overthrow this, this, this dictator, you know, because Biden has to go. And, uh, you know, we need your, we need the Chinese government's help. You know, the Communist Party needs to step in and basically, you know, protect freedom in the U.S. And, you know, we need you to, to train people, on, you know, in our land. You know, we need you to finance nonprofits. You know, we need you to finance media. We need you to pass sanctions. You know, we need you to isolate the U.S. diplomatically. That's the kind of dissent that has been banned in Nicaragua, right? And so, like, the people who were banned uh, from running and many of whom are in jail were people who did things like that, you know? And so you, we asked the question because we don't really know what these people have been up to, uh, but that's basically what, what this boils down to. You know, the people who have been incarcerated were involved in highly violent tactics that led to the deaths of hundreds of Nicaraguans, you know, during this attempted coup. And they were forgiven, you know, via an amnesty law. And they were told, you know, you can't engage in that anymore, you know, but for the sake of reconciliation, we're going to let it go and we're going to pass this amnesty law. And they went back at it. You know, the U.S. continues to try to undermine Nicaraguan the Nicaraguan government and the Nicaraguan revolution, and these people are open about it, right? And so I, I actually believe that it's part of the uh, the strategy of the U.S., you know, is to basically throw these people on, out into the lion's pit and make them do things that will uh, force the government to take action and say, you know, we're not going to tolerate this and we're going to arrest them. And then, of course, you know, the story gets selectively reported and they said, well, these were all political candidates that were not political candidates, they were not people who belonged to any real party. They had not been elected by anyone in any party to run. You know, the, the vast majority of the people who were arrested were arrested in May when there was an election in November of last year. So for you to be a, 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 a you know, legal opposition, you know, basically because they said that, you know, like he basically ran an election without opposition. That's not true. The traditional opposition, so the parties, you know, that had legal uh, standing, legal status, you know, they all pretty much ran unless, you know, they were involved in destabilizing the country or they were involved in the commission of crimes. But these people did not have, you know, a political platform, did not have a party. They, um, but they had not been selected by anyone as political candidates and they had been involved in the commission of crimes and treason against Nicaragua. So if you if you if you try to understand it, you know, from an American perspective and you think about, a, you know, a U.S. politician, whether they have declared that they want to run or not or whether they have been nominated by the one of the official parties, um, just the fact that they will go to a foreign power, you know, and one of one of these guys actually came to Nicaragua with a bag full of dollars, you know, I mean, like that's how blatant it was, you know, that these people, the kinds of things that these people were doing. You know, talking about a Panama option, you know, talking about the invasion of Panama, talking about, you know, uh, handling President Ortega the Mussolini way, you know, which you guys remember that he was hanged upside down, those kinds of things, right? So the political opposition in Nicaragua was very much alive. And, you know, if they're not thriving, it's because their interests do not align with the interests of people, but they still are able to run, they get votes. They have representation in the National Assembly and all of that. So there's a lot of, um, you know, um, th there's a lot of twisting and 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 um, of the information. As far as uh, Ortega's wife being the vice president, you know, this goes back to what we were talking about, the term limits and whatnot. Nicaragua, it's not a regular democracy because Nicaragua has been in the sights of the U.S., since the 1850s, basically, if not before that. 
uh, one, what, this is when we had the first invasion, you know, it wasn't a U.S. government invasion, but it was a U.S. government supported invasion um, that we have been in the sites of the U.S. And um, because the, 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 uh, the, the traditional uh, political establishment and the economic establishment and the institutional establishment in Nicaragua has been so incredibly racist and classist and pro-imperialist, you know, whether it's for Spain or for the United States. Um, and the Sandinista movement, you know, beginning with Sandino in the, 1920, in the late 1920s up until this very day has been basically a rejection of the status quo. It has been a rejection of Western imperialism, whether Spanish or American. And the way that that has played out is that we have not been really able to live or to, you know, carry on with our business in a normal way, because we have always been in the sides of, you know, U.S. aggression, whether it's via sanctions or, you know, uh, direct military inv invasions or proxy invasions or, you know, sabotage or you name it. Right. And so we are not a country that's able to say, well, you know, we're going to work on a uh, revolutionary plan, you know, where we're going to have uh, presidents that are going to be basically, you know, working the same way that the United States worked to be able to transform the entire status quo, to be able to transform the power dynamics and to change history in the way that the Sandinista government has changed history. And because of that, Daniel Ortega has continued to run and the people have, have continued to believe in him. What happened in the 1990s was that after the uh, the Contra War and after the sabotage, you know, that the U.S. was found guilty at the Hague, after the uh, the sanctions and the blockade and everything like that, when the Sandinistas lost the election, everyone thought that uh, the Sandinista movement was over, right? And you guys might remember that I said that because Somoza had disrupted that you know liberal conservative balance. He had been hated by everyone and the Sandinistas were able to gather a lot of the different sectors within the population to fight against the dictatorship of the Somoza family. And that included oligarchs and that included people from the bourgeoisie, middle class people, people who are not necessarily um, in line with a popular revolution, but that hated Somoza so much that they had to be a part of a movement to overthrow him. And so what happened after the overthrow of Somoza is that the Sandinista government is a mixed government. We have people in power who are bourgeoisie, oligarchs, you know, we have intellectuals, we have people who are literate, we have people who are peasants, we have people who are college professors, writers, you know, priests, everything. Everything under the sun became a part of the revolution because Somoza was so hated. And so fast forward to the 1990 election, we lose, and a lot of the people who were upper upper middle class and that includes my dad you know who was a famous musician but all the intelligentsia in nicaragua you know the 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 the, the bourgeois revolutionaries the oligarch revolutionaries those were the people who held down the international relations in nicaragua those were the ambassadors you know those were the college educated people who became ministers they became judges they became you know uh, they held down the uh, solidarity movement between nicaragua and a lot of the people who are in solidarity with Nicaragua, like Chomsky and Ellsberg and people like that. And so when there's this disruption, you know, when the Sandinistas lose the, the, the election, everybody thinks, well, it's over, you know, let's play nice with the U.S., let's get neoliberalized. And there, there is a, a battle within the Sandinista party between those who wanted to remain popular and those who wanted to become neoliberal. You know, like we remain nationalist, populist movement for the people and we're going to continue fighting from the ground up and there were the ones you know like the the bourgeois um former sandinista leaders and the oligarchs um some of the wealthiest families were part of the sandinista movement they were you know part of the government uh, and so what happened was that they took all their their political power which was basically a lot of the deputies on the national assembly former ministers former diplomats and there was a split and within that split you know a lot of the people who were the intellectuals and like all the the bourgeois and like upper middle class and wealthy class 
uh, formed the Revo Renovation Sandinista movement. My father was part of that. And the people who were working class, the people who were peasants, the people who were, you know, workers and whatnot, the proletariat basically stayed with the Sandinista, with the Daniel Ortega faction of the Sandinista. And so that was devastating because they had so much of that institutional power. They have so much education, they have so much experience, you know, with diplomacy and all these things. And the line of communication between the revolution and a lot of the movements of solidarity in the US and Europe was held by this class of Sandinistas that now were like jumping ship saying, that's it, we lost to the US. And so what happens, you know, once you neoliberalize a revolutionary country, the government steps back, you know, the, it, the government withdraws from education, from healthcare, from energy, from all of that, and it, it all becomes privatized. But the private sector does not want to meet the needs of the people. They want to make a profit. And so they focus on the people who are able to pay. If you can pay, you have healthcare. If you can pay, you have education. If you can pay, you have electricity. And so that leaves a huge vacuum. And who fills that vacuum? The nonprofit, um, the nonprofit system. And so a lot of these people, a lot of these former, you know, revolutionary bourgeois and oligarch Sandinistas became executive directors of nonprofits and human rights organizations and media organizations. And they were all financed by the USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy and the, you know, the Soros Foundation and the Open Society Foundation and, you know, like all the money that's behind the nonprofit industrial complex in the US and in movements, you know, all over the world, you know, from Hong Kong to the Ukraine to whatever, they were active in Nicaragua that entire time, right? And so what happened was that after we lost this, all this institutional power that went with these people, who wanted to play nice with the U.S. and become neoliberalized, um, at the next election, we lost to this um, coalition between the oligarchy and the, the bourgeoisie and, you know, like the Sandinista um, that split off. We lost in terms of the, our base was less than their combined base. We had about 35%. but the faction of the Sandinista that broke off from the Daniel Ortega faction did not win anything. They won like maybe 5% of the vote while we won about 35% of the vote. So we took back all of the institutional power, the National Assembly. You know, we won a lot of uh, regional elections, uh, uh, mayors, you know, councilmen and women. And it became clear that the popular base had remained with the, the Daniel Ortega faction, while the bourgeoisie and the middle class and the intelligentsia, they basically became isolated politically. They did not have any political power. They did not have any popular power. So their alliance with the rich, with the liberals, the conservatives, the bourgeoisie, the U.S., the U.S. embassy, and you can read all this shit on the on the WikiLeaks embassy cables, you know, like all these alliances that were brokered by USAID operatives, you know, working out of the embassy with the former Sandinistas. Um, and so that's basically, you know, what explains that split off and that a lot of the people who were once Sandinistas and were very high profile Sandinistas, well, they were very high profile because they were well-spoken, educated, spoke several languages and whatnot. And because they came from a class that was not a popular class, it was not poor people, it was not peasants. And so the Sandinistas, you know, uh, were able to reclaim um, the power because they, they stuck to a popular, you know, nationalist, you know, people-centered agenda, while the, the faction of the Sandinista movement that split off went with the bourgeoisie and the U.S. and the, you know, neoliberal model. Um, and so the the wife of president ortega is not like just his wife you know she was someone who had been part of the insurgency you know prior to the overthrow of the uh, of the um, of the dictatorship she's a well known figure in nicaragua she's a very capable woman and at one point you know people had the choice to elect him and continue on with a with the program that the sandinista movement and party and government had been implementing implementing for a long time uh, by voting for them or vote for the opposition, you know, for the oligarchs now split, and they chose to vote for the Sandinista party. So, at the end of the day, you know, it was 
a clear choice. It was an open election. It was highly observed and monitored. And the people voted for that type of change, you know, and they didn't care that the vice president was married to the president. And, you know, that's something that as long in my, the way that I view it, as long as the people voted for that, that's it. That's what we have. And I support the government. I support the vice president. I support the president because the kind of transformative change that the people in Nicaragua have seen under the Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo government is unlike anything that has ever been seen in Nicaragua. And if you have a history of oppression, you know, feudalist oppression, where people are not viewed as people, but they're viewed as the extension of the right of the oligarchs, and you go from that to being an actor of change and to being in a society that has been built from the ground up, the choice is very clear. You're going to vote for the Sandinistas, you know, whether the vice president and the president are married or not. And so to me, that's really what, what matters. And uh, I think that the, the combination between Rosario Murillo and Daniel Ortega is brilliant because he's a visionary and he's someone who has been through uh, so much, you know, as a guerrilla, as a commander, as a president, as somebody who was leading that movement from the ground up when everybody thought that the Sandinista movement was over and has gone through so much that he has this command of the people and he has this command of the history and the trajectory. Well, while she is someone who is uh, uh, somebody who's able to execute and to make things happen and to manage and to administer and someone who shares a vision with Daniel Ortega and the militancy. And so you know, they complement each other in a way that has worked out for the Nicaraguan people, unlike anything has worked out for the Nicaraguan people in our entire history. So I support our government. I support our president and vice president. I know I think Giovanni has something to, to add. Yeah, I was saying this is not, a, and it's not uncommon. It's not been uncommon in, in the region. It's not been uncommon in politics. I mean, if you look at uh, in Argentina, for example, the, the, the popularity of, of Juan Perón for example, was, was highly uh, due to the popularity of, of his wife, Eva Perón, who she wasn't a, she wasn't a de jure vice president, but she was kind of a de facto vice president. She was very, uh, very active in, in the decision-making in the government of, of Argentina. Um, something, a similarity here in the United States, you can, you can say the same thing about FDR, you know, uh, part of the popularity of FDR, you know, was due in large part because of the popularity of Eleanor, and although she wasn't a she wasn't a uh, uh, an official in government, you know she was a first lady. She was highly involved in the decision making and 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 the activity of, of government in, in the United States during that era. Uh, another thing I want to touch in what you said about liberalism, you know, and 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 liberal democracy was you know was more as deal with democracy. I think you touched, you know, you touched the, uh, the head of the nail when you said about uh, an inactive, you know, an inactive government, you know, so the political uh, project that's being under liberalism that's being projected throughout the world is that of having governments who are inactive, who, who step back and let the, let, let the other agents, you know, uh, whose, whose structure, who are structured, who are, who are, who are incentivized by profit. To govern and to and to run the affairs of the state, right? Um, you know, you mentioned you know you mentioned the neoliberal, you mentioned the uh, the nonprofit organization, but I could say, you know, here in the United States, you know, uh, everything's left up to markets, you know, and that's the and that's the type of government that's being projected. You know, when COVID hit, the first thing that was said, you know, let the market take care of it. You know, uh, so we have you know, so you put, you're promoting this this inactive government, you're not promoting this. This government of actions, this this active government. When you have active government, then that is called uh, here, in, at least here in the United States, that is projected as authoritarianism. You know, dictatorship because they're active, they're involved. You know, so what you what you're saying is you want you know government they're not involved in the affairs of the people, they're not taking care of people, and you just lift it up to the market. Who's who's uh, who's the centers, Like I said, it's profit. Like you mentioned. Another thing I wanted to mention before we close off is you know uh, I mentioned Juan Peron. Juan Peron said that. Uh, that real politics is international politics. Everything else is is uh, administration and, and, and management, right? Something to that affair. Uh, I want to know what is uh, Nicaragua's international politics, uh, international geopolitics. Most countries in the hemisphere uh, doesn't have a, a an independent 
uh, international uh, uh, policy. Most of their most countries in the hemisphere policies extended to that of the United States, right? Whereas, oh, you know, governments like Cuba, for example, for a long time has had independent uh, politics, international policy. I want to know what is if you know if you know if you um, can share with us, you know, what is Nicaragua's international policy? And another thing before we close, also, you know, you live in Miami. Uh, Miami has been the center of Latin American reaction for, you know, for decades, you know, uh, every time a popular government comes to power in somewhere in Latin America, you see reactionaries just flock into Miami from Miami, they, 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 they do operations of the stabilization, right? And there, it doesn't help that they get, they have politicians like, like, like Debbie, like Debbie Schultz, uh, from the Democratic party, like, uh, Paco Rubio from the, you know, from Republican and you know, all that parties. You know that that play interference for them for the for the uh in this reactionary forces that that congregate Miami and you know and, and project and pretty much direct American policy you know to you know to placate to these reactionary forces right but live in that in that city and I can and I bet it's it's hard to organize in a city like that uh can you just share you know how 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 you know that experience how is that like? Yeah, definitely. Um, ever since the Cold War, you know, we have declared ourselves as a non-aligned nation. And, you know, I, I do believe that as with a lot of other revolutionary movements for independence, you know, where people have become emancipated, they have looked up to the United States, right? And and initially, a lot of the, the countries that have become uh, free from the oppression of another power or a dictatorship have initially, you know, reached out to the U.S. Uh, for help and, you know, for cooperation and uh, to basically have a friendly relationship. Cuba did that, you know, Castro did that. Um, I think Ho Chi Minh did that, you know, in Vietnam, we did that. And, you know, we remain open to working with the U.S. as long as it's, you know, on, on, on equal footing. We have never um, viewed the United States as an enemy. Uh, we've had, obviously, to fight for our sovereignty and our democracy with U.S. governments. But we've also been blessed with a lot of internationalism coming from the U.S. and you know, other parts of the West. And there is a lot of love between Nicaragua and U.S. solidarity. In fact, uh, Brian Wilson, you know, who's a naturalized Nicaraguan, was honored, you know, during the uh, 43rd anniversary of the revolution, not, not, not that long ago, on July 19th. And Ben Linder, you know, who's a martyr, you know, who also also a U.S. citizen who was killed by the Contras, uh, who was a clown and an engineer, you know, who was working on, on projects in Nicaragua when he was killed. Um, he's very much a part of, uh, you know, the, the, the Nicaraguan uh, psyche, you know, in, in with regards to U.S. internationalism. Uh, in terms of the foreign policy, we are open to working with anyone. We still do trade with the United States, but we also do trade with China. We do trade with Russia. Uh, we we have a working relationship with pretty much any nation out there that wants to to do work with us. You know, we we also help in any way that we can. Uh, during the pandemic, um, a lot of the um, regional governments shut down their economies uh, to go into quarantine and social distancing and whatnot. Like a lot of industries uh, were basically uh, halted completely. And that created a food shortage in, in, in the region. And Nicaragua stepped in and helped a lot of our partners who are not pro-Nicaraguan revolution, you know, partners that are very much in alignment with U.S. policies and, you know, who had basically been installed by the U.S., you know, like in Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras and whatnot. And we have continued to work with them. Um, so we have, a, I, I guess, like the best way that you can define our foreign policy is that we are a sovereign nation. And we're always going to act in a way that is in the best interest of our, our country, our people, our land, our natural resources, and, and our independence and our freedom. And if the U.S. wants to be a partner to that, then great. Uh, we will work with the U.S. But if not, then, you know, we'll look elsewhere. You know, we'll work with the Russians. We'll work with the Mexicans. We'll work with, 
anybody who wants to do trade with us, you know, we'll do trade with them. anybody who wants to do solidarity work with us. We're open to that. Um, regarding um, the Miami atmosphere, uh, you'd be surprised, you know, a lot of the uh, the institutional powers in the hands of, you know, that highly reactionary exile, not only from Cuba, but also, you know, you have a lot of Venezuelans and you have Colombians and, you know, you have a lot of people who adhere to, you know, the uh, the U.S. puppet um, in the in, in their countries of origin mentality, right? Like whether it's people who are now anti-Petro or people who are anti-Chavez or anti now Maduro or, you know, people who think that Boric is a leftist or people who think that Fernandez in Argentina is a leftist, you know, we have them all here. Uh, but by and large, I think that the majority of the people who had, you know, uh, migrated from South America and other parts of Latin America to Miami are people who are um, economic exiles. You know, they're not very political. Um, and so the struggles that we that I work on here are struggles that people um, of all uh, walks of life, you know, ideologically and politically are supporting. You know, we have a housing crisis just like anywhere in the U.S. and we're out there advocating for housing. We have uh, police brutality. We're out there, you know, calling out police brutality. We have uh, pretty much, I mean, I'm pretty sure that you guys in Portland and in Texas, you know, you have some of the same the same things that are going on here. And those are the things that I'm, I'm working on here. You know, I work on local policies and in and, and coalitions with other organizations. I don't really do a whole lot of um in Latin American um work in in Miami most of that work happens on a national or an international level you know like what we're doing right now or like the work that we have done um in the past you know on hybrid warfare or you know um going to conferences and things like that but I don't really do a whole lot of Latin American um activism um one, because it's not really uh, something that I'm in a position to to move people on, uh, because here it would be really difficult, you know, to get something like that off the ground. And two, because there is so much more that has to do with people's day to day living, um, you know, families being kicked out, you know, food insecurity is a huge thing here, uh, you know, lack of access to health care, lack of access to education. Uh, disenfranchisement of returning citizens. I mean, you name it. And we have all those issues here. So my work as an activist and as a professional really are focused on that particular type of work, you know, not not so much on uh, calling out, you know, U.S. hybrid war in Latin America or or elsewhere. But, you know, that's that's work that I'm involved in, but more like on a national level, not so much here in Miami. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. If you were to um, you have anything else to add? Um, you know, close this out. Um, Noah, uh, I uh, thank you, thank you so much for your uh, for your time. I uh, I appreciate you being willing to to wade through my questions. And and you know, I, I uh, Nicaragua and Latin America are still pretty new subjects for me, but it, it it is getting easier to understand all the different layers that come in with hybrid warfare and. Like NGOs and and all all these different areas that you know where information comes from, um, but uh, thank you again for for your time for uh, for answering our questions and everything. Um, is there anything that uh, you'd like to plug? Talk about stuff that you have upcoming or uh, website, Twitter, anything like that. No, not really. I think we've covered a lot. And uh, but, you know, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. And uh, if you want to keep working together, I'm willing, you know, like just reach out anytime. Obviously, you know, I'll, I'll, I don't mind answering tough questions. You know, I know that there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of times that's the only information that people have. Yeah. So um, this is this is part of why we do this work, you know, because we want people to know. And, you know, I'm also willing to learn. You know, I don't think I'm I'm right all the time. You know, I think that. Uh, we're all subject to making mistakes and whatnot. So, um, you know, if you ever want to do this again or, you know, maybe change the format to a debate or something like that, I'm willing, you know, I'm always willing, as long as we do it in a way that leads to people uh, questioning things. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't want people to necessarily believe what I have to say, but, 
and that's that's one of the ways that I open, you know, my talks. You know, when I whenever I give a talk, I tell people, please don't believe anything I say. Just keep an open mind and then go do your own research, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And 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 question what you're being fed uh, by main by the mainstream, and uh, maybe take take some notes and go out there and you know do some fact checking. Um, Will you uh, remind our audience the the title of your book? Yeah, it's uh, "Road from Avramati: Ramadi, The Private Rebellion of Staff Sergeant Camilo Mejia. And I'll make sure I, I uh, include a link to that in the show notes if anybody wants to, to pick it up and read about your story. I've just gotten started on it, but it's already been a, a really good read. It's really a, a fascinating story and a, a, a powerful one. Um, and uh, last thing before we close out here, I want to make sure to mention our uh, Telegram channel. Fortress on a Hill is now on Telegram. Please, if you uh, use Telegram for uh, other stuff that you follow, please come and say hi. Join our channel. Send us stuff that you think is uh, important. And uh, I think that'll do it for us today. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for being here, Camillo. And uh, to all of our listeners, we will see you all real, real soon. Take care. We're on Twitter you, right. at Fortress Take on care, a Hill. Guys. And also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. I will not do